allow the purity of evil to guide you. WWF Judgment Day in your house took place on October 18th, 1998 inside the Rosemont Horizon in Rosemont, Illinois, now known as the Old State Arena. The show drew around 18,000 fans in the venue and an estimate of 305,000 pay-per-view buys, and fans were tuning in to see a new WWF Champion get crowned. Our main event features The Undertaker taking on his little brother Kane for the championship, Steve Austin's gonna referee that match, and Vince McMahon says that Austin's gonna get humbled tonight one way or another. We'll talk about the main event a little later on, but let's check out the opening contest first. It's Mark Merrow vs Al Snow. Mark Merrow vs Al Snow does sound like another match from the WWF pay per view random match generator, but Jeff Jarrett shows up to tie things up a bit. Double J's been having problems with Al Snow recently, and Al even cost Jeff a victory over Scorpio on Heat. Double J wanted to take Merrow's spot here to wrestle Snow, and the referee doesn't allow it. Jarrett gets sent to the back, and the bell rings. Snow performs a par slam and head watches on as Marvelous Mark takes a clothesline. Mero fires back with a jumping back elbow and Mark wants to get himself some head but Snow stops him from doing so with a schoolboy pin. Al Snow then feigns a punch and Mero positions himself nicely for a DDT. Snow then goes upstairs and we see a great looking moonsault from Al. Old Al Snow doesn't get brought up much when folks talk about moonsaults but he definitely had a good one. Jackie then jumps on the apron to distract Snow. The plan works and Mero's able to hit Snow with a low blow followed by a DDT and Jackie gets involved again when she chokes Snow on the middle rope. Mark then performs a knee lift and speaking of good moonsaults, check out Marvelous Mark right here. This isn't enough to win the match though and Snow fires back with a ton of headbutts and an enziguri. A sit down spinebuster gets a good pop from the audience and Al decides to go up one more time for a moonsault but he misses his target thanks to Jackie pulling Mero out of the way. The match ends with Mero pulling off a Samoan drop, he pulls his shorts up and he goes up for the Marvelocity. Snow's able to move out of the way, but Merrow gets a foot on the ropes when Snow covers him. Mark then goes for the TKO, Al counters with a snow plow, and Snow defeats Merrow in the Judgment Day opening match. Let's take a quick moment to check out what happened on Sunday Night Heat. There's a few things going on that's worth bringing up. Paul Bearer's here tonight. Michael Cole wanted to know if Paul had something planned for the main event, but Paul says he's only here for the food and the locker room camaraderie. Not sure if I believe that to be honest, but we'll talk more about Paul later on. Steve Austin arrived at the building and the Stooges told him he wasn't allowed in the talent locker room. Instead, he was shown to his own little crappy changing area where his referee shirt was waiting for him. Austin didn't seem too bothered to be honest. Triple H had to present Ken Shamrock with the IC title. Shamrock won a tournament on Raw and the injured Triple H had to begrudgingly hand the title over. Hunter wouldn't even look at Ken when he gave up the belt, but Hunter did tell Kenny Boy to suck it after leaving the ring. So backstage, Shamrock slammed Hunter's car door into his injured knee. To be honest, Hunter deserved it. Farouk declined the Godfather's uh, services and he really should have thought twice about that because Godfather ended up beating Farouk in the middle of the ring. D'Lo and Mark Henry attacked both Farouk and the Godfather after the match. So that's all of the Nation of Domination's loose ends tied up. That's it over folks. The Rock came out to chase Dilo and Mark away. Remember, Rock faces Henry tonight on the pay-per-view. And then, during a commercial break, the Jackal whispered something in Farouk's ear that seemed to pique the interest of the former leader of the nation. This is the beginning of the Acolytes tag team. Speaking of which, Bradshaw took a loss on Sunday Night Heat, Big Bully Balls fell victim to Steve Mavug and Blackman, and why this match wasn't included on the pay-per-view, I'll never know. Still, it wasn't all sunshine and roses for Stevie. The Blue Blue Blazer attacked him again after the match, so it looks like we're going to see a Blackman vs Blazer rivalry play out on WWF television. Vince McMahon made an appearance along with the big boss man in the local K9 unit. McMahon reminded everyone that Austin's gonna get humbled tonight. Stone Cold has to raise the winner's hand in the main event, or he's gonna get fired on the spot. 
Next up we have a 5 minute 6 man tag, LOD 2000 and honorary Road Warrior draws versus 8 ball, Skull and Paul Ellering. Road Warrior Hawks apparently on the mend, Jerry Lawler states that draws has kinda wormed his way into LOD 2000 and he's effectively taken over Hawks spot, but Hawks stated on Raw that that's not the case, he's happy to have the youngster in the LOD's corner. Animal takes a swinging neckbreaker but he puts Biker Michael Liker number 1 down with a clothesline before attacking Biker Michael Liker number 2. Animal then performs a dropkick and Hawk tags in. Hawk delivers a power slam followed by a clothesline. He's looking good here although he really needs to shave that head again doesn't he? In comes Draws with a jumping back elbow and the DOA decide to isolate Draws and bring him into their corner. The dirty old assholes have their way with Mr Puke and even precious Paul Ellering gets in on the action a bit. Not much, just a bit. Draws gets a break following a DDT, he tags in Hawk, the road warrior cleans up and it looks like the old LOD is back in business. Draws takes care of Ellering and Biker Michael Liker number 2 on the outside while the road warriors pull off the doomsday device. The Chicago crowd loves seeing their boys performing the move, but then Draws dashes in to get the pinfall victory, something that annoys Road Warrior Hawk. We'll see how this plays out, Road Warrior Animal doesn't seem to mind too much but Hawk definitely has issues with Darren Drozdov. Next we have a light heavyweight title match, champion Takamichi Noku defending against Christian. This is Christian's in ring debut on WWF television so no pressure lad, get out there and make yourself a star. Christian's storyline brother Edge watches this one from the rafters. Taka started off strong with his dive over the top rope to the outside and back in the ring he dropped a knee over Christian's neck. Taka was able to kick Christian after getting whipped into the corner but Christian pulled off a falling inverted DDT that slowed Taka way down. The challenger then pulls off two suplexes followed by a falling front suplex that Gangrel seemed to enjoy quite a bit. The champ finds himself in a chin lock, not where you want to be, and Taka then flies out of the ring, allowing Christian to springboard from the middle rope to the outside. The commentators talk about the mystery surrounding Christian Edge and Gangrel. We still don't know anything about these guys or their history but all three men have already shown how competent they are inside the ring. The match continues on with a body slam from Christian but his diving splash misses its target. A dropkick leads to Christian ending up back on the outside and Taka pulls off a great looking acai moonsault and back in the ring Michinoku has some fun chopping down his opponent. Christian's able to roll through following a crossbody from Taka but he only scores a 2. The two get up and Taka tries a Michinoku driver but he has to settle for a low drop kick instead. The match comes to an end when Taka performs a tornado DDT and he signals for the driver one more time. He gets Christian in position but the challenger counters with a roll up and we have a new light heavyweight champion. Not bad for your first televised WWF match, right? Taka gives up the championship he's held for so long but let's be honest, he didn't have have a tremendous amount of challengers either. Let's see if this is a new era for the light heavyweight championship with Christian leading the charge as the new champion. A good match by the way, you'll want to check this one out. Goldust has returned to WWF and he's got a match against Val Venus, the man who shagged his wife. If there's ever a reason to have a wrestling match then this is probably it. Goldust is all fired up at the opening bell and Venus thinks he's getting a break after throwing the bizarre one out of the ring, but the big Valboski gets thrown into the barrier and he gets dropped on the ring steps. It looks like Goldust is enjoying the crowd reaction he's getting here tonight. Venus is able to throw Goldust out again and this time he's a bit more successful. He pulls off a diving attack from the top rope but he decides to go airborne again inside the ropes and Goldust counters. Goldust uses the top rope for a little assistance during a back suplex. He throws Venus into the corner and he follows up with a clothesline. Venus continues to struggle after an arm drag and a grounded neck snap but a failed corner charge from Goldust gives Val an opening and a target to aim for. Venus zeroes in on Goldust's left arm by ramming it into the ring post. He drops his ball sack on the injured body part too and that does does some serious damage. Venus pulls off a hammerlock and a few elbows to the shoulder and then Venus tries to get a submission victory by putting more pressure on the arm. Goldust gets up but he goes right back down following another clothesline. Venus again goes for a submission and honestly they have killed the crowd a bit here. It's that kind of ambience where there's no cheers and no boos, it's just people talking among each other. Goldust's comeback gets stopped when Venus uses the top rope to his advantage. Goldust then 
takes a Russian leg sweep followed by a big power slam and Venus signals for the money shot. The big Valboski goes upstairs but Goldust wakes up and Venus takes a big superplex. Goldust misses a follow up elbow drop though and the two end up sharing sleeper holds. And yeah, I'm just not feeling this one at all and it's a shame too seeing as the return of Goldust was built up pretty well on Raw. This just feels really by the numbers. It ends with Terry getting on the apron. Goldust confronts her but he moves out of the way when Venus tries a sneak attack. Val puts the brakes on and Goldust hits him with a low blow. Goldust wins via pinfall and the big Valboski needs ice down post haste. Michael Cole announces that Triple H was re-injured during Sunday Night Heat. X-Pac calls Shamrock a jack-off and he says Ken will be dealt with tomorrow night on Raw, but X-Pac's now ready to go out and try to reclaim the European Championship. So we have D'Lo vs X-Pac, I think this is the fourth time we have watched these two wrestle throughout the Relive in the War series, but they do work really well together. D'Lo's absolutely delighted with his shoulder block at the opening bell, like he's really really delighted. X-Pac performs a headstand to get out of a wrist lock and D'Lo goes down after a spinning back kick, but Pac's hip toss counter that usually leads to good results doesn't do so well this time around. D'Lo's in top form tonight boys. D'Lo drops a few elbows and Pac gets chopped in the corner, the European champ lines up a corner splash but Pac moves out of the way and D'Lo finds himself in a position that he doesn't want to be in. X-Pac lines up a bronco buster, he's looking to end it early and oh, this happens so often that I'm surprised X-Pac has a wiener left. D'Lo delivers a leg drop, he locks in a deadly chin lock, the ref has to check if Waltman's still alive while taking the most dangerous move in the history of the business, but somehow Pac's still breathing and he gets to his feet, only to get put right back down again with a leg lariat. D'Lo's super confident as he plants X-Pac with a running power bomb. he then sets Pac up on the top turnbuckle for a superplex but X-Pac pushes him away and we see a big crossbody. D'Lo rolls through but he only gets a 2. X-Pac's bad luck continues when he misses the standing bronze Buster, as is tradition, but he's still able to kick out a two after a diving elbow from D'Lo. The European champ then locks in a Texas Cloverleaf, there's a loud D'Lo sucks chant in the arena and this means D'Lo was 100% doing something right in this match. Pac then gets body slammed and instead of the lowdown D'Lo tries a diving senton and he completely misses. X-Pac then gets his second wind, he pulls off a beautiful spinning weight kick followed by his signature jumping clothesline, a drop kick puts D'Lo in position for another bronco buster attempt and this time X-Pac is able to deliver the move. China gets in a cheap shot here too, just for good measure, but the match isn't over yet, it's a kick out of two from D'Lo. The champ then knocks into the referee, Mark Henry comes to the ringside licking his chops, and the world's strongest man keeps China distracted while D'Lo hits X-Pac with the European belt. Mark puts the ref back in the ring, and X-Pac kicks out of two. These two have the crowd in the palm of their hands here, and it's great to see, easily the match of the night so far. It ends with D'Lo performing another powerbomb, he then goes upstairs for a high risk move and Pac catches D'Lo with an axe factor. Even Jerry Lawler wasn't sure what kind of high risk move D'Lo was actually attempting here but it's still a big win for X-Pac and it's Judgment Day's best match so far. X-Pac's a two time European champion and I highly recommend you check this one out, a great performance from both men. Michael Cole says there's a rumour going around, apparently Paul Bear went into the Undertaker's locker room. If Paul's back in the Undertaker's good books then that could spell trouble for the whole WWF roster. And speaking of trouble, the headbangers show up to make fun of the New Age Outlaws. Thrasher says the road dog trashed the headbangers boombox with his face and now the lads can't listen to their Marilyn Manson CDs backwards. Thrasher then calls Billy Gunn a country bumpkin and Mosh calls badass rockabilly. Mosh can't believe that the New Age Outlaws are the tag team champions seeing as the only thing they're good at tag teaming are each other, <laughs> my my. And then Mosh says this. Cause tonight you're doing the J-O-B on the P-P-V. <laughs> the New Age Outlaws make their way to the ring for this tag team match, they get a great ovation as always. Road Dog's got a mic in his hand and you know what that means. Liquid is still hovering around the roof of Tower B. He's waiting for you. Snake, it's time for you to take him on. Shut up. 
The headbangers storm the ring, but they quickly get taken out by Road Dog and Billy Gunn. Marsh takes a beating from both outlaws, and Thrasher doesn't have much luck either when he gets tagged in. Road Dog puts Thrasher down with a shake rattle and roll. The headbanger takes a corner clothesline, but a blind tag allows Marsh to dive back into the ring, and old Jesse James is now in trouble. Double team moves keep the headbangers in control. I was thinking at this point that it's way too early to build towards the usual Billy Gunn hot tag, but it happens after Road Dog hits a back suplex and Mr. Ass cleans house. Still though, it's very early in the match, so what the outlaws are doing here is building to a Road Dog hot tag, which normally doesn't happen at all in their matches. It's actually pretty interesting. The headbangers isolate badass. Road Dog does more harm than good when he complains to the referee. The headbangers are able to pull off this front suplex double team move from the top rope, and things look bleak when Marsh brings Billy all the way down with a chin lock. The Road Dog's getting the fans all hyped up by crossing his arms and chanting DX, while his tag team partner fights for his life in this devastating submission hold. Billy pulls off a flying head scissors. We don't usually see that from Mr. Ass. The headbangers prevent Billy from making that all important tag and Billy takes more punishment as Marsh and Thrasher work over one half of the champs. The headbangers are doing a good job of baiting Road Dog in, which in turn leads to the referee getting distracted. Heel Tag Team Wrestling 101 and it's done really well here. There's chin lock number 2, there's a sleeper hold right there, and that's Marsh and Thrasher performing a flapjack and signalling for the end of the match. The outlaws have been completely out wrestled in this bout. Road Dog does not get the hot tag. The headbanger set Billy up for a stage dive, but James decides to get in the ring and hit Mosh with the headbanger's own boombox. So the outlaws lose via disqualification, but they keep the tag team titles. The headbangers came out of this looking better than the outlaws in my opinion, and yes, I know. The outlaws are so cool and who cares, it's all about DX and the fans still popped, but Mosh and Thrasher were simply a much better tag team in this match, and the outlaws looked like they didn't have an answer for a tag team who just a few weeks ago weren't even getting featured anymore on WWF Raw. Michael Cole has another scoop. Paul Bearer just went into Kane's locker room. This isn't a rumour, Michael Cole saw it with his own little beady eyes. Mankind joins Michael for an interview. Cole says fans are expecting a brutal match tonight between Foley and Shamrock, and Mr. Socko says he knows a thing or two about being brutal because he's had the pleasure of watching Ken Shamrock interviews. Mr. Socko's wearing black underwear tonight. Ken Shamrock should open up and say ah and have a nice day. Mankind vs Shamrock's our next matchup, and seeing as Kenny Boy won an IC title tournament on Raw this past week, the Intercontinental Championship is up for grabs in this next pay per view match. Shamrock's got a new attitude, he's been working as a heel ever since breakdown, and he starts off aggressively by going straight after Mick's left leg and knee. Ken then moves to the arm after catching Mick out with a clothesline. The crowd chants Socko as Mick stays on the mat after a fireman's carry, and Mick's able to fight back with a back elbow and a boot to Kenny Boy's head. Foley then performs a body slam. He hits Ken with a leg drop, but he only gets a two. And Shamrock then applies a hammer lock that Foley struggles to get out of. Things get a bit more vicious when Ken starts kneeing Mick in the face while Foley sits in the corner. This seems to piss Mick off as he dives in with a double leg takedown, but Shamrock slows Mick down with a few punches to the head followed by a front face lock. The two get up and Shamrock pulls off a Hurricane Rana, and to answer this, Mankind locks in the Mandible Claw. The crowd pops, Shamrock panics, and the world's most dangerous man quickly gets out of the ring. Now it's Shamrock who's all pissed off. He challenges Mick to step outside the ring and Mick happily obliges. Turns out Ken was using the old noggin and he quickly gets back inside the ropes where he steals an advantage. But Mick's still able to bring Shamrock down and he goes for the Mandible Claw again. This time Shamrock fights out and Mankind gets his head caved in. The fight does go to the outside and it's Shamrock who takes the first bump. Kenny Boy gets tossed into the ring steps and Mick wants to use a steel chair, but Mike Kyoto tries to stop Mankind and Shamrock ends up kicking the chair in Foley's face. The referee also doesn't seem too bothered when Shamrock swings the chair at Foley's head, but sure. The match continues on in the ring where Shamrock focuses again on Mankind's arm and wrist. Mankind breaks free by chomping on Ken's head. Shamrock pulls off his signature belly to belly and the crowd pops when Mick pulls off the double arm DDT. Mick goes on quite the offensive flurry next when he performs his running knee strike in the corner. He follows this up by dropping a forearm while Shamrock's hung up in the tree of woe, and Mick also pulls off a leg drop while Ken's head's draped over the bottom rope. 
Mick then salutes the fans as the fans hold up some unsavory signs, including this one right here. China, it's awesome. Uh, wow. We go back to the outside when Mick throws himself at the IC champion. We then see the signature apron elbow drop from Mick Foley, but Mick gets too confident and he gets power slammed on the ring steps. His knee takes all the impact here, and this is what Ken really needed. He gets Foley in the ring, he applies the ankle lock, and Mick desperately crawls to the bottom rope to force a break. Unfortunately, Shamrock just locks it in again and Mick doesn't have the strength to crawl anymore, so he decides to punch himself repeatedly in the head before applying the mandible claw to himself. Mick passes out, Shamrock retains the IC title, but Ken isn't happy when Hart Finkel announces that Shamrock won due to the mandible claw. Shamrock freaks out and he attacks Mick and the referee. Old Kyoto takes the belly to belly, but Mick wakes up and he stuffs Mr. Socko down Shamrock's throat to keep the fans in attendance happy. Not a bad match at all, and I liked how this one ended, unlike that Outlaws match. Mick refusing to tap out to Shamrock's move was a great little moment and it says a lot about the Mankind character. He'd rather knock himself out than give up to someone he doesn't like. Michael Cole's been a busy man tonight. He wants to get a word with Vince McMahon next, but the big boss man says no. As a matter of fact, the boss man's gonna shove his nightstick up Cole's ass and show Michael what hard times are all about if he doesn't scram. Bit harsh, but okay. Next up, we've got Mark Henry vs. The Rock. Henry and D'Lo attacked Rock on Raw this past week, so the Great One's looking for some revenge tonight. Mark gets in the ring. He's written another poem for China, the same woman he's accusing of harassing him. And the poem goes like this. China, you are lovely, I love you to bits, I want to hold you closely and play with your big bouncy… basketball. The Rock enters the arena and the crowd treat him like an absolute megastar. He gets in the ring and he throws right hands before sending Mark into the ropes for a clothesline. Mark gets sent from corner to corner before getting hit with another clothesline, and then The Rock suplexes the world's strongest man. Mark gets sent into the ring post on the outside, but he's finally able to go on offense after hitting Rock's head off the announce table. In the ring, Mark performs a back elbow followed by a big elbow drop. The Great One takes a clothesline and he gets choked on the ropes. Mark tries to put Rock away with a leg drop, but when that doesn't work, the big man wraps his big hands around the people's chin. When Rock breaks free, the Great One lays in a few right hands in the corner before planting Henry with a DDT. Mark then gets body slammed, and the crowd rise to their feet for the most electrifying fang move in sports entertainment, the people's elbow. D'Lo then runs down the ringside and Rock gets distracted. This allows Henry to floor the people's champ and Rock takes a big splash. Mark covers Rock and Mark Henry wins the match. I remember being quite surprised when this happened. Rock was being pushed really hard during this time period and I thought he'd have no issues getting a win over Henry. But Mark leaves Judgment Day with a big win under his belt that, to be honest, wouldn't hurt the Rock in the slightest. Main event time, The Undertaker vs Kane. Stone Cold Steve Austin's our referee and Austin must raise the winner's hand after the bout or he'll get fired. The belt's been vacant since WWF breakdown. McMahon was gonna give the belt to one of the Brothers of Destruction the night after the pay per view but seeing as Austin attacked Vince, something the brothers were supposed to prevent, the chairman booked this match instead so Kane and Taker can beat the hell out of each other. When the relationship between Vince and the brothers broke down and when Vince was caught flipping the brothers off behind their backs, he ended up getting attacked and he got his ankle smashed by The Undertaker. As for Austin, the former champ has to humble himself. McMahon wants to embarrass Austin when Stone Cold has to raise the hand of the new WWF Champion tonight. And if that doesn't happen, then Vince guarantees that he'll fire Stone Cold on the spot immediately following the match. Both Undertaker and Kane's entrances are great with the entranceway getting set alight for the big red machine and the Undertaker getting some loud consecutive pyro explosions as he slowly walks down to the ring. The brothers then shake hands, it looks like they're happy with the best man winning the match and we might see a somewhat fair contest between these two. The referee Stone Cold Steve Austin then marches down to the ring and he gets a bigger pop than both of the competitors in this main event. Steve Austin warns the guys about hair pulling and kicking below the belt before flipping both guys off. The bell rings and here we go, the Judgment Day 98 main event. Fair play goes out the window and Undertaker attacks his brother from behind. Stone Cold watches on as Undertaker attacks in the corner and the dead man performs old school very early in the match. 
A back elbow brings Kane back into it. The Phenom gets power slammed as the crowd chant Austin's name. Undertaker fires back with a big boot and a clothesline. The Undertaker covers Kane and <laughs> looks like it's going to be a long night for the Brothers of Destruction. Just to piss the Undertaker off more, Austin fast counts when Kane covers the dead man. So it's clear that Austin isn't going to call this one right down the middle. He's going to do whatever he wants. The match goes to the outside where the two brothers fight at the entranceway. They then bring it back to ringside with Kane taking a bump at the ring steps. And Austin offers Undertaker a cord to choke his little brother out but the Undertaker declines. When the Phenom grabs a steel chair instead, Austin's like yeah that's totally fine. Kane manages to avoid the chair shot and the Undertaker gets rammed into the ring post before the match gets back in the ring. And the back and forth action continues with Undertaker performing a suplex. There's a bit of a communication problem when the brothers come to a stalemate but the Undertaker takes advantage and he begins focusing on Kane's leg and knee. This has been a new Undertaker strategy as of late and he's gonna see how it works against his little brother. The Phenom applies that leg lock he gave to Vince a few weeks ago on Raw and the same leg lock he used in the previous Raw main event. Kane doesn't give up though so Undertaker smacks his brother's leg off the apron a few times. He also uses the bottom rope to do more damage. Kane gets tied up in the corner while Undertaker tries to inflict as much punishment as possible on that knee but Kane won't give up. The audience gets restless as Undertaker uses the top rope to choke his brother. Boring chants can be heard and the cameras even focus on Austin for a moment because there's nothing else to look at really. The crowd seem almost relieved when Kane pulls off a spine buster but the rest holds and choke holds definitely didn't do this match any favours in terms of crowd reaction. I'm summarising here of course but it did go on way too long. Things heat up when The Undertaker accidentally clotheslines Austin in the corner and when Stone Cold steps forward he ends up getting chokeslammed by Kane. The brothers then decide to beat Austin up so we have no referee. Kane seems to enjoy beating up Austin a little too much and he forgets he's in a match with his big bro. But when Undertaker again attacks Kane from behind, this time the big red machine is able to answer with a chokeslam. It's at this moment when Paul Bearer walks down to the ring holding a steel chair. He gets inside the ropes and he wants to take out The Undertaker. We think Paul's joined forces once again with the big red machine, but no. Paul actually hits Kane and he invites The Undertaker to pin him afterwards. Maybe Taker and Paul are back together, who knows. But Austin refuses to award the match to Undertaker and instead he hits the dead man with a stone cold stunner followed by a chair shot. Austin then counts both men's shoulders to the mat even though there's no cover and he orders the bell to ring. We don't have a winner tonight, instead we have Stone Cold Steve Austin announcing that he just won the match. Stone Cold grabs a mic and he tells Vince to wheel his ass out of the entranceway. Austin's pretty much inviting Vince to fire him. McMahon doesn't show up so Austin heads backstage to look for the chairman. He checks a few rooms but no one knows where Vince is. So Austin heads back out to the ring and he says he knew it. He knew Vince didn't have the guts to fire Stone Cold. Just then McMahon orders for the screen at the entranceway to move and we see McMahon and the big boss man behind some plexiglass and Vince tells everyone to pull their cameras out and get a photo. This is going to be a big moment because it's the last time fans will ever see Stone Cold in a WWF ring. McMahon says screw you Austin you're fired. Austin wants to make sure he heard that correctly. So Vince says it again before leaving his little protective box. And that's it Steve Austin has been released. Austin says he was wrong, he didn't think Vince had the guts to fire him but he guesses hunting season's going to start a bit early this year. Austin says he may have been fired, he may never be seen in a WWF ring again but he promises that one day he will cross paths again with Vince McMahon and that's the bottom line. The show ends with Austin saying goodbye to the fans. He has a few beers in the ring as Jim Ross says the greatest of all time is no longer part of WWF. The fans stick around for Stone Cold's beer bash and we'll have to wait and see how this plays out tomorrow night on Raw. We still don't have a WWF champion though and it also looks like The Undertaker's relationship with Kane has been torn apart again thanks to Paul Bearer.
I enjoyed Judgment Day more than Breakdown a month prior. Judgment Day felt a bit more consistent with matches having actual builds on WWF TV, whereas Breakdown was seemingly half booked by the old WWF random match generator. Dilo vs X-Pac was the match of the night for me, Shamrock and Mankind found a good balance between all out brawling and traditional wrestling, and while Kane vs The Undertaker isn't the best match between the brothers, the ending leaves a lot of things unresolved but in the best way possible. You do feel like you need to see Raw the following night to see what happens next, not only with Stone Cold, but with the WWF title too and the Brothers of Destruction. Remember too, The Rock is still the number one contender for the championship. So yeah, not the WWF's best show of 1998, but you can do a lot worse. This one comes recommended. Join me on Thursday for Reliving the War and hopefully we'll get some questions answered. Thank you very very much for watching and please take care.